point in time. Uh, let's get uh, Ashwin Parekh in then on uh, our discussion on uh, the Standing Committee on Finance, uh, basically uh, opposing the corporate houses entering into banking. Uh, uh, Mr. Parikh, hi, good morning. That really is the first question. Is that a legitimate concern? Well, it is a concern to the extent that, you know, uh, for three years now, we've debated this aspect. You know, the whole argument came up, let's say, when the first, when, 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 when the first time the whole process began, when the then Finance Minister, Honorable Shri uh, Pranab Mukherjee, made a reference of new licenses in the budget speech about four years ago three years ago and then thereafter three and a half years now and thereafter you know the regulator came out with the first discussion paper we had comments on that then there was a second discussion paper we had comments on that the regulator studied all that then he came out with the guidelines once again there were comments on that during all this process we accepted the fact that corporates are the ones who will be able to bring in capital which is essential in the banking sector if the banking sector sector has to fuel the economy which could grow at about seven, six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent, the amount of money required in banking sector by way of capital is of the order of almost about 30 to 32 billion US dollars, you know, in a span of next five years. Even RBI has confirmed this by way of a separate paper. If we need that kind of capital, corporates are the ones who are in a position to bring this. By way of policy, I certainly see that there is a certain amount of a disconnect between the government and the regulator. The government did believe at some point in time that some of this capital could come from foreign investors as well. RBI continues to believe that for the banking sector it makes larger sense to mobilize this capital from domestic markets rather than from foreign investors. And to that extent the whole guidelines were issued in keeping with that understanding which uh, the government, the Ministry of Finance and <coughs> The, the, the regulator came out with. Opening up that now, I mean, after three years or three and a half years of debate, to my mind, you know, makes the whole thing unnecessarily, I thought, a little more controversial, I would say. Mr. Parikh, the biggest risk of industrial houses entering into banking is interpromoter lending. How much of a risk is that and how can there be checks and balances? Well, interpromoter group lending is something which I suppose is a, I mean is something which the regulator will have to be very careful about. There is no denying that fact. In fact, the minute you open up the banking licenses to corporate houses, then there is at least there is a possibility. You know whether that does happen or otherwise will all depend on the kind of people who will get into the banking kind of business. But there is a possibility that interpromoter a uh, kind of uh, lending could become a major major uh, issue later on. This is one of the reasons why perhaps the nationalization of banking had to take place, in fact, in the first place uh, some 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago. So it is a reality. But once again, I am very confident in my mind that that's something that the regulator has to worry about. He comes out with regulations on a regular scale. If he finds that there is a behavior, his order of supervision on the banking system is, is, is extremely good at this point in time compared to what it was about four or five decades ago. So he has a larger hold on the banking sector today. If he finds that there is any behavior of this nature, he's going to come out heavy. Certainly he's going to come out heavy on, on such promoters. And, and let's not forget, I mean, what kind of control will the promoters have? The guidelines talk about diluting the promoter's interest in a span of three to about 10 years to almost, I mean, from 15% to almost a negligible amount, sort of, you know. So to that extent, these fears, which are valid, but they've been addressed. I mean, that's the point I would like to make. Okay, hmm. okay Mr. Parikh, uh, the other point which is being spoken about is increasing the minimum capital requirements to 1,000 crores versus 500 crores. If in case that does come through, will we see many of the applicant, applicants just drop out since their plans were worked or on the basis of 500 crores? Well, once again, I mean, you know what has happened is, let's understand the process. Based on the guidelines, people have drawn their applications. More significantly, they have drawn their business plans in keeping with that. Now, if you really asked me, and since I work very closely with so many people who have applied, you know, I can tell you that there is no single application which is going to use up 
about 1000 crores of capital in the first year itself. You're not going to garner the kind of deposits which is essential for you know, uh, requiring, I mean, a thousand crore kind of capital. You'll need it after perhaps two years or three years. Why would you start with 1,000 crores? You know, is first question that I would like to ask. The second question that comes up is, well, the process has begun. People have made their applications. Now, with those applications, the regulator is going to examine. You can't change the rules. You can't now say that only those out of 26 people who have applied, who are starting off with a capital of thousand crores should be admitted. This would really take the whole process back then in that case. Hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Parang, then coming to the question, will there then be a delay in the process of bank licenses being issued, uh, considering the possible reworking on fit and proper and maybe even uh, uh, the minimum capital requirements? Uh, well, I don't think so. What may happen is perhaps, you know, if the regulator were to satisfy uh, let's say on the grounds on which let's say the observations have been made that the regulator has a valid reason to process and continue with the process of issuing licenses then I suppose I suppose things might work out well a lot depends however on how the parliament and the political system basically accepts this one got an impression right from the very beginning that this was more a move of the parliament and the government because they approved the financial budget that there was there was an acceptance that there is a need for more banking companies in the system it starts with that premise now if that premise is valid then i suppose both the parliament and therefore the government and also the, the regulator should really work together in making sure that the whole process, you know, A stands up to not only a scrutiny internally with our domestic deposit holders, but also externally with foreign investors and in, in the world outside. If we do any flip flop now, then we may perhaps make ourselves, you know, I mean, uh, uh, people, I mean, a bunch of people who people will start examining not so seriously then in that case. You know. hmm. Okay, so how many licenses do you expect to be issued eventually? You see, once again, basically the whole, the entire question now is that of the scrutiny, the evaluation. I do believe that those who have showed and do, those who do actually have a good order of governance, who have showed very clearly that they are going to participate in inclusion, you know, very clearly. And also they have the necessary deep pockets and wherewithal. Now, it is on the deep pockets and on the governance where things might come to a halt in regards to these 26 applications. Perhaps, you know, some number of applications, I mean, it's, I can't guess because I have not seen those applications, all the applications, but a good number, I would say, I mean, about 10, 12 applications or about 15, 16 applications may just stop there on account of either the past record of governance, non-compliance or uh, their larger exposure to one particular sector which is also uh, in some form or the other a concern for the regulator you know or their presence in any kind of speculative business whatsoever okay and uh, lastly then just based on all of these facts um, do you think that NBFCs have a stronger chance to get banking licenses as opposed to industrial houses well the RBI registered NBFCs could have stood and you know, could have really had a very good chance in regards to this. Unfortunately, the guidelines are not too conducive for the NBFCs. Uh, the conversion of their existing NBFC business and enrolling it into the bank is one of the major, major uh, showstoppers. And, and, and this is a roadblock which the NBFCs have immediately after the clarifications were issued, they had actually pointed this out, you know, that it does become very difficult to some of the very large NBFCs you know, uh, may find it extremely difficult to convert themselves into a bank from the first day or within that 18 month period after the in-principle approval that the regulator has talked about. All right, Mr. Parikh, thanks very much for joining in. So that's the view coming in on uh, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance and the observations that they made with, with regards to the new bank license applications by the RBI. Currently, the Nifty... MCX Stock Exchange, India's new stock exchange presents Markets and Macros.